So prior, prior to this um, summit starting, uh, David Stables, so some of you might know, a health IT legend, co-founder of EMIS, wrote, uh, wrote a piece called The Negotiable Standard. And there he says that one of the barriers to having uh, healthcare data interoperability is a lack of a common information model. Then some people read it and go, what in the world is an information model? So our first speaker of the day, um, Ian McNichol, will help enlighten us on this. And I've known Ian for quite a while now. He's, a, he's an retired GP, uh, but now is an informatics uh, guru, educator, and chair of the Open Air Foundation. So welcome, Ian. Thank you. Uh, morning, everybody. This is not at all intimidating. Uh, <laughs> following Bob Wachter, uh, introduction from Amir, and then David Stables gets thrown into the mix at the last moment. Um, there are a number of familiar faces to me. I've been in and around this community for a while uh, in different guises, but there's a lot of people that I don't know. And one of the aims of this was an understanding that actually the, pa the level of knowledge for all of us is very patchy. This is a really specialized area. And all of us have our little nuggets of wisdom. And in some, case, in some senses, we're trying to just step back a little bit and give, try to give everybody an overview of what we all do and what, what are all the challenges and what are all the opportunities in this space. So in some respects, some of you for this will feel this is a bit dumbed down. Uh, for others, it will be enlightening. And I'm looking forward to seeing the same from other, other lectures. So I know a bit about terminology. But I'm looking forward to seeing what Dai is saying about that, because there will be insights that I, I am missing over the time. So I've been asked to start on information models. And I guess, um, first of all, yeah, I'm a former GP, turned to the dark side of health informatics about, well, actually about 30 years ago, then got on with being a doc for a while, and then found myself back firmly doing health informatics full time, and working in particular with this technology called OpenEHR. I'm the co-chair of the not-for-profit that runs that. I'm not here to talk about that, but it will come into the talk because it's, it's relevant to the subject. It is very much about developing clinical content and information models for systems or for, for uh, clinicians. So what are, what is this mysterious thing called the information model and why, and why does it matter? So we think, start to pull back and flesh out Michael's story. Effectively, what we have here, for a little, a part of this journey, which is the discharge, um, you know, we got effectively three applications trying to talk to each other. Some dumbed down again, there's probably a pharmacy system in there somewhere. But we've got some kind of hospital system. We've got a GP system on the far right. In the middle, we've got this magical uh, medication application. And the reality is, that this Michael story does turn out to be Michael's information. What we're trying to do to tell that story between each part of that service is about the information about Michael, the clinical information about Michael. So what is this thing called an information model and why does it matter? Well, here's a pretty uh, simplified version of the anatomy of, of a health app. What's inside? What's under the hood? And most people have got a vague idea that there's some kind of application. Most people have got a vague idea that there's some kind of persistence or database, or maybe it's just a file. It could be an Excel spreadsheet on a, on, a, on a machine, local machine. What most people don't really get to grips with is this thing called the information model that sits in between them in the vast, vast majority of systems, clinical and otherwise. Yeah, so the application is the bit that we see, we work with, the thing that really matters to us, the thing that needs direct clinical engagement to get it right so that we have you know, a, a something that works, works alongside us and we don't fight against us, as, as, as Bob said. You know, that's a big problem. Doing good clinical software is really hard. And we need a lot of innovation to get better software. We need, we need the new entrants to the market, new ideas, uh, smart people coming up with different ways of interacting with the, with the, the uh, information. And then we've got this persistence or storage layer. So this is the database. This is the physical storage engine in which, in which the, the data gets put. It's where it's physically stored or saved. It could be a file. Normally, it would be some kind of database. And it's very specifically dependent on the database technology. It doesn't matter whether it's a SQL Server or Oracle uh, or some of one of the newer MongoDB kind, kind of databases. You need to know how to talk to that thing directly. And you need to understand its own internal language or how do I find this bit of data. And you have to know exactly where that bit of data lives. 
In between the two, though, live this thing called the information model. In a very generic sense, an information model is just a description of the structure and content of the kind of information we want to capture. That example there is, is just a paper form. It's a, a do not attempt uh, resuscitation form that was developed in Scotland. You could say that's an information model because it's not a blank sheet of paper. It's not, it's not like my encounter note in GP when I've got a blank sheet of paper and I put on there what I want to put on. This is guiding me. It's constraining me in the kinds of information that I, I, I'm trying to record. And effectively, that's what we're trying to do with an electronic information model as well. We're trying to reflect some part of clinical practice, some type, type of clinical requirement, but we're constraining the clinician. We're constraining our users to provide us with information in a particular way. And internally, every application has some kind of information model. I will say that without, without any fear of contradiction. But it can also be used as a messenger interface definition when we're talking between systems. And then there's the third kind of uh, beast that we see, which is the, the kind of reporting minimal data set. The National Health Service Data Dictionary, uh, COSDI, the Cancer Outcome Service Data Set, actually even the COF in the GP system uh, world, that kind of reporting data set, which often has a very, very different feel in terms of the way that the information is described and constrained, because it's coming from a different requirement. In a more technical sense, the information model is generally used to in manipulate information inside the computer's memory. It's the working memory space for, for the computability. It's often written in a specific programming language, and it's often locked into a particular application or device. And I know there's at least one person here who will recognize this little bit of information model, um, part of the Opal system, and nicely documented in open source. OK. And here's the problem. As Bob said, and you know, this is why we're all here, we understand that. The problem with this information is we've got three different apps, and we want that vibrancy of different interfaces. That's what we want. We want good stuff that's a good fit for our particular work. But they also have their own information models. They've all been siloed. So the information silos actually reflect information model silos. We're quite happy for these to be on different databases. We don't really care what physical database it's on. We really do want lots of vibrancy and innovation in terms of the UI. That's been the revolution in the apps market, is giving that kind of, uh, that kind of agility. But the problem is, at the moment, that goes along with being locked into the information models for each of these. And that's why we get disparity between systems. And that's why we get siloed information. And as a, an example, here's some very specific mismatched clinical information models. Here we've got the hospital app, and it describes for, uh, uh, yeah, for medication, it describes the substance, atenolol, the root, oral, uh, the dose, uh, 100 milligrams, and the frequency uh, at uh, 8 a.m. And that's a very typical way that a hospital prescribing system or, or any hospital system would describe medication. You come to, me to come to a GP system, and this is absolutely across the board, they all do it the same, for good technical reasons, and actually the, because the prescribing, the way that the GP, uh, GPs prescribe is actually different from the way that hospital doctors prescribe. So this is reflecting a, a real world reality. This is not system vendors you know, deliberately messing things up. Uh, or clinicians making a mistake in the way they model things. This actually reflects a reality of our working environment, that we do things differently. To information models that don't line up are sometimes for good reasons, and this is a good reason. In the GP world, we prescribe effectively products. We prescribe uh, something like a, a 10 or 100 milligram tablets or capsules, and we don't split up dose and timing. So what's the poor old patient app supposed to do? You know, does it talk that language or that language? Well, probably it was developed by somebody who didn't really know any of this stuff. They just went and spoke to a couple of uh, patient reps, or maybe they spoke to a doc who didn't really understand those subtleties. So they just made up medicine name, dosage, and frequency. It's good enough, isn't it? Well, it's not good enough. If we want to exchange computable information, that's not near good enough. That's the problem that we have. Just to go into this a little bit more, there are different kinds of information models. If we're talking about moving information around, the ones we've been talking about up to now are really application-specific. 
In other words, each application internally has its own own information model. And there's that's the mismatch, that's the problem, that's the disoperability, if you like. Most of the efforts and most of what we'll be talking about over the next couple of days in terms of interoperability are attempts to solve that problem by saying, okay, we could have all of these different applications trying to talk to each other individually, but wouldn't it be much more sensible if we developed some kind of commonality Let's develop some kind of common information model that we all talk to as an intermediary. You know, a, a, some kind of common or agnostic way of thinking about medication that we can all sign up to and exchange data through that, through that medium. And that's really what the HL7 set of standards, uh, the FIRE standards you're going to hear about, are positioned in that place. But there are alternative models of thinking about this and different ways that information models are being used. And one is the idea of a vendor-specific platform. So the idea is that instead of there being multiple different applications, each with their own information model, there's some kind of information model platform against which multiple applications work. Okay, so they all share the same information model, but their work is actually physically different applications. So that's not unlike the Google Android or, or um, you know, uh, iPhone apps idea. Standard platform, single information model, but multiple different applications doing different things, working against that. And the community and organization that I'm working with, OpenEHR, really is taking that idea but trying to make it more open. So that we're saying not only are the apps um, provided by different suppliers and vendors, but the back-end services are also provided by different apps and services. And we try to get clinicians directly involved in the design of this common information model. So this you know, common model in the middle is very definitely the focus of interoperability for now and should, should be so, but there are different ways of trying to crack this over time. And we may see these ideas of actually genuinely shared information models with different applications and providers coming into four uh, in the future. So application-specific model, just some examples. Drug, dose, route, start date. Information exchange model. So this is the interopen ones. And I'm going to talk too much about these because uh, I know David here is going to talk about that more. But this is very much the HL7 FIRE community. Now, what you'll understand just by looking at these slides is that this is quite detailed stuff. <coughs> this is not easy. You know, uh, this, this is quite complex. And there's a degree of technical complexity. But actually, that's the easy bit. Getting technical stuff to flow back and forward We've solved that for a generation. You know, XML, JSON, Matt's going to talk about the details of that. Not saying there are not challenges in that, but fundamentally, the internet has made that a solved problem. We have 100 different ways of exchanging data technically. The complexity in here is actually about the clinical content. That's the bit that really doesn't join up and requires clinical input and quite a lot of intellectual input to solve it. You know, you can't hand that off to you know, an out-of-university smart master or PhD graduate and ask them to solve it unless they have some clinical understanding of what all these data points mean. Medication item, preparation details, directions, description, that's all clinical stuff. It's detailed, it's complex. I didn't understand this stuff. I was involved in building this model. Um, I didn't understand it until I spent a lot of time talking to pharmacists who are the real domain experts in this space. But if we're going to get good information models, we have to find a way of getting clinicians directly involved in this work, but keeping the technology a little bit at arm's length to let them focus on the clinical content. And that is an ongoing and tricky problem. The guy who's following me and Jeremy tomorrow are going to be talking about terminology. And one of the things that I often hear is people saying, we need lingua franca. The lingua franca? That's not even a word. Uh, lingua franca. Um, snowmed. You know, we just, if everybody just used SNOMED, we'll be fine. And I actually sort of believe that. I think we should be using SNOMED. I have no problem with that at all. But SNOMED on its own will not solve this problem. SNOMED has to live in a context. Unless you're really crazy and want to sort of reinvent the universe, every system in the world has an information model that plugs SNOMED or some other kind of terminology into that information model. It doesn't do the whole thing. No system in the world does it. So you know, we'll have lots of interesting discussions later about how to fit these two worlds best together. But fundamentally, they're trying to solve slightly different problems. And left to their own 
you know, primary use case, their own best fit, they actually play very nicely together. So in this uh, information model, which is an allergy, there are at least two absolutely critical key points where terminology has to play the game. One is, what's the name of the substance? What is it that you were allergic to? Salicylates. And the other place is, and what happened as a result? Well, they got vomiting. Plug in the SNOMED into the information model. Long, complex discussion, the sort of thing that terminologists and informationists like me fight about over beers. But you know, there is a simple solution that would actually take us a long, long way and deliver meaningful interoperability, make Michael's life a lot easier if we just stuck at that. And so here's a here's the, come back to this issue of clinical accessibility. Um, this is a, an old information model, actually from uh, Microsoft Health Vault. And uh, they've changed it since, but this was what they originally produced. Don't worry about the details. All of that is an allergy model. Okay, that's an information model, the way that Microsoft Health Vault did allergies. And there's a lot of stuff on that screen. Only the ones in green have got anything to do with clinical care. I can't, I can't read it because it's too small, because I'm too old. Allergen code, allergen type, effective date, first observed, is negated. These are all things that I could take to a clinician and say, give me an opinion on that. Is that right or is that wrong? All of these other things are actually very important. They're part of the technical infrastructure. They're, part, they're also part of the information model, but they're more on the, the technical backdrop. Things like common data, created, effective permissions. What's that one? Is personal. I don't know, really know what that stuff is. It's not important to me. So, you know, it's, it's difficult enough to get clinicians engaged with this kind of work if you give them the whole thing. We have to try to tease out the clinical parts of that and get them to answer those questions because that's their skill set. One of the big, uh, big advances I've seen in the last few years, and I think some common understanding, is that we won't be able to solve this very difficult uh, problem. You know, health, health is unbelievably complex. And what we're seeing is some pulling together of different ways that people have been trying to solve this problem in terms of the way to crack it is to break it down into components. We call them in open air, we call them archetypes. In the FAR community, they call them resources. And actually, we work together. There's a great deal of commonality in the way that we work. So if you look at our archetypes and FAR resources, they actually look very, very similar. But the point is to break these things down into little chunks. How do you do allergy? How do you do problem? How do you do lab test? And then get clinicians to really get these bits right. And then we can reuse them in all sorts of contexts. We can use them to message to the pharmacist. We can use them to message to the GP. We can use them to expose an API to Michael's medication app. But if we try to ma do this at the level of a discharge message or a referral, it's just impossible to do. The problem space is too hard. Get the components right and then join them together hey-ho, we can make real progress. Because part of the problem there is that the components are never right. So we're always going to have to go back to the people who designed the allergy model or the problem model and say, hang on a minute, there's something different. There's a new use case. There's a new community. There's a new bunch of clinicians who say that that's not right. So we're always going to have these little teams working on these little components you know, in a very part-time sense who can be called upon to take a judgment if a new requirement comes through for some new information, is that needed? Do we put it into the component? And then it's available to the whole community. And part of that, and again, this is emerging as a way of working, is that when we build these components, we kind of over-specify them. We put more stuff in than is required for any individual use case, because it's easier to manage that way. You know? Um, a blood pressure model might have not just systolic and diastolic, but cuff size, body position, all sorts of things that not everybody needs. But we handle that by then profiling it down. We call it templating. Uh, you'll hear about profiling from David Hay later on. But it's the same principle. Taking a more generic, chunked component and then profiling it or templating it or shaping it, both to aggregate it and construct these bigger stories like a discharge message or a referral, or a GP encounter, but also to allow those not used data points to be taken out of scope. You know, so as a GP, I don't really need to know body position, right? Arguably, well, I probably should record cuff size, but we won't. You know, different people in different contexts 
need different cuts and dices of that information. As long as we pin the basics in the, in the back end component and say, if you want to do cuff size, this is how you do it. If you want to do body position, this is how you do it. We're not saying you have to. That's a negotiation between, between you and the people you're sharing data with. Then that becomes a much more powerful way of managing the complexity of this space. So here's an example of this idea of reusing components effectively in different uh, end use data sets. So on one hand, we've got a diabetic checkup. On the other end, we've got a GP antenatal anti visit. In the middle, we've got these core components that we are really working on. These are our sources of truth. And then they're shaped differently, and they're used differently. There's a different set used in the antenatal visit. It has a, a fetal heart there, which isn't required in the diabetic checkup, but a great deal of commonality, and of course, an ability to query across these messages and, and these stories. You know, just give me the last 10 blood pressures. I don't care what context it was taken in. You know, I, I, don't, I have to be able to query across these things and pull that data out, regardless of the context it was doing. If we get the components right, that will do it. I love this. Trump says, nobody knew, I can't do a Trump accent, sorry. Nobody knew that healthcare could be so complicated. Really? <laughs> Thanks, Donald. Why is this standardization of care so hard? Well, one of the things I think people coming outside, particularly people who are coming at it from a data science perspective, is that they forget that what we're talking about here is actually documentation of care. We're not trying to build models of the human body, of physiology or biology or genomics. We're, we're really primarily about documenting care, about what we do. Now, of course, the biology and the physiology creeps in there, you know, the blood pressure, what was the problem? But that's not actually what a, a clinical record is primarily. It's about the interaction between ourselves as clinicians and patients and other stakeholders. And it's also really important to recognize that a health record is not just a giant bucket of data. It has to be managed and processed to make it fit for all our individual purposes. We are effectively a, um, a uh, well, you know, it's a mixed environment, so I lost my words there. Information models are models of clinical practice, and we can only design them with significant clinical input. And there's all these economic, cultural uh, constraints on us as well. So finally, at the heart of this problem and inter interoperability are misaligned clinical information models. And that's what David's excellent paper he just put out was really about. We have to get hold of this somehow. In clinicians, it's, it's us. Those ideas come from people like me being asked, what's an allergy? So we are at the root of the problem. And we're the ones who have to help solve it. Breaking those components into, re sorry, breaking those complex models, data sets, into reusable components is really the only way we can solve the problem. And we cannot deliver this interoperability solution without much deeper clinical engagement. That means tools and training and methodology. And I hope that's what these two days are about. Thank you.